Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Primesberger, editor of eWeek in eWeek.com. Thanks for joining us today for our latest edition of eWeek eSpeaks. Our interviewee today is the CTO and founder of Kong, Marco Palladino. Marco, welcome. Thank you, Chris. And so you're not the CEO, are you? You're the CTO, and you chose that. CTO. For What's that? CTO, you, yeah. you prefer to do the business rather than rep the whole company? I'm a technologist at heart. So I, I come from an engineering background. I, I like building products. Um, I'm not managing sales teams. is not really my passion. Yeah, you know, you got to know what you do best and do it. Tell me a little bit about your background, Marco, and uh, why you started Kong. Yeah, so... Um, Kong comes from another company. When I first moved to the US from Italy, uh, we moved here, me and my co-founder, to start MashShape, which was the first API marketplace in the world for APIs. Yeah, and that's M-A-S-H-A-P-E. Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah over, over the years, MashShape grew to uh, provide tens of thousands of APIs to hundreds of thousands of developers. And, uh, and back into that, you know, when we first built MashShape, it was a monolith, you know, and that's very common. You start something new, you want to make sure there is product market fit. So monoliths are great for that. But then if it does grow and scale, we need to find a different architecture that allows us to innovate in a much faster, with a much faster pace. Um, and, and so we decided in 2014 to transition away from the monolith into microservices that was a year after Docker was released. That was about the same time when Kubernetes was first released in 2014. Mm -hmm. and, and we needed, you know, we were processing billions of requests with our proxy. We needed to create a new proxy, uh, a new gateway that could run um, in this new modern architecture. And of course, there was nothing in the market available. So we did build it for ourselves. We open sourced it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the company was called Mesh Ape. Uh, there was an ape logo, and so we decided to call our gateway Kong, as in King Kong. Okay. And yeah. then over time, King Kong grew in adoption. It, it turns out that what we needed for microservices is that is what everybody else else needed uh, if they transitioned to microservices. And so the, the adoption just grew from there. We decided to focus on Kong only, and um, and sell the marketplace business to another company. So. Over time, my shape Inc. became Kong Inc. effectively. Yeah, I remember in 2015 going to um, DockerCon at the Marriott in San Francisco, and it was so crowded there. It was incredible. You couldn't move from point A to point B without bumping into somebody. It was the hottest thing ever. And then after that, they had to go to a much bigger venue. But things have changed a lot for Docker. Um, uh, they've had some issues, but the whole thing with microservices and containers continues to flourish, correct? Correct. And you guys are right there at the forefront of the distribution of all the APIs for all these things. Yeah, you know, it's a very natural and organic progression. As, as every business becomes digital, right? The, it, everybody knows it, that if you're not digital, if you don't have a digital presence, then you don't exist, right? And so every business in every industry is becoming digital. And so they build applications that users and consumers and customers start using. The next challenge is, okay, fine. Now that we have the digital applications, how do we make sure that we can fix bugs faster? How do we make sure that we can create new versions faster? How do we make sure that we can be reliable and closer to the end user, so reduce the latency? And as a result of that, the, uh, the monoliths, the applications they're building, they become distributed, they become decoupled, they start running on multiple regions, multiple data centers, they transition to microservices. You know, microservices allows for much quicker deployments, much quicker releases. Right. Uh, and as soon as we do that, we introduce connectivity in our architecture. It's inevitable. And so what, what do we use to manage that connectivity? And this is really where Kong um, can, can, comes in, right? To abstract away that connectivity use case away from, from the developers who are building the apps. Okay, so the, yeah, the developers can build it for any use case or any platform, correct? Now, is this a cloud platform only? Uh, it, it is actually both. It is in the cloud as well as you can download and run it yourself, right? Uh -huh. And so we do, 
we do we do have uh, both methodologies. You know, we, we're working with over 250 enterprise customers uh, in our customer base, but then we also work with we have over 200 million downloads of the gateway in our technology with 1.5 million instances of Kong running in the world. And gateway is just one of the things that we do. We also do service mesh with Kuma. Uh, we also do, um, you know, API development and testing with Insomnia and Kong Studio. So there is a lot that we do when it comes to API and microservices. But, um, but the software can be downloaded, installed in their environments. It can run in a multi-cloud capacity. And then if they want the control plane managed by Kong, you know, that's also an option, right? So we do have a, a Kong cloud for our uh, customers. Okay. So is it up on GitHub or what? Yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's the most popular open source API gateway out there. Uh, so it's on GitHub. Uh, we work, you know, and this is a little, a little bit of the, you know, that open source DNA that MashShape had really was uh, actually beneficial for Kong down the road. Sure. Uh, when we look at microservices and Docker and Kubernetes and, you know, and Kafka and Elastic and Prometheus and Grafana and Kong itself, what's the keyword? The underlying keyword is open source. Open source has been driving and enabling this microservices transition. So yeah. uh, being open source, it's, it has been critical for Kong. Yeah, as a former editor of Linux.com, I have a great deal of respect for the open source community. And um, I follow it as closely as, I, closely as I can, although I have a lot of other topics I cover too at eWeek. Could you just, um, Marco, give me real quickly a, an example of a use case that um, that's close to close in mind and what the business values are for that for that uh, customer? Yeah, um, we're working with many many different use cases in pretty much every industry vertical. Uh, there is lots in finance, lots in telcos, uh, but for example. Half, half of the digital world payments are being processed by Kong, thanks to uh, our very phone implementation. So if you are- Did you say of, half? Yeah, half. Whoa. Yeah. Um, Kong is, is, is in that chain of command somewhere, right? Yes, it, it, Kong can never go down. It is in, a, in the mission critical path of, of real world use cases. If Kong goes down, world payments go down. If Kong goes down, flights don't take off in Asia anymore because Kong is being used by pilots for the pre-check uh, pre for, for each flight. So if Kong is not answering that, the plane, the plane doesn't leave the terminal. Whoa, uh, you, guys, you guys have your own data centers or do you run it on Colo with uh, AWS or others or what? We, we work with our enterprise customers to make sure that we can deploy our platform uh, which is made of gateway and service mesh and you know all sorts of things. We make sure that it's being deployed in their environment, and uh, and then there is a, a subset of those customers that they want to run the control plane in the cloud. But now, the data planes are always running in their environment. So the data plane proxies and gateways, uh, even if um, you know uh, those are running closer to the APIs and the microservices that our customers are running because the goal here is to make sure that the latency at runtime, it's very low. The right. performance must be great. And as a matter of fact, I mean, performance has been always top of mind when it comes to, to Kong and, and the things that we do. Okay. So, um, well, um, Marco, listen, I really, really appreciate you coming on with uh, us at eSpeaks. Our time is just about up. Um, could you um, perhaps uh, just give us a summary of what the company does for our readers? for our, our viewers and then uh, is it kong.com or if well, somebody wants to go find you on the net where do they find you well if you google for kong two things come up it's either us or the dog company so we are the infrastructure technology vendor it's konghq.com hq konghq.com yes konghq.com okay great yes yes, yes why don't you summarize for us Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we, we provide a full, a full stack enterprise connectivity platform. So, you know, back in the days when we were building data centers, we were buying servers and racks and we were connecting those servers, the physical servers with, with Cisco switches and Cisco routers. Think of, think of Kong as the Cisco for L4 and L7. Okay. You know, as we transition to microservices, we're going to be having modern connectivity challenges in, in uh, either mesh or gateway or at the edge. And our platform, is being adopted by architects to provide that underlying infrastructure to the application teams. And so we abstract away all of that connectivity, the same way Kubernetes abstracts away the data center operations. Wow. 
it sounds like Kong is in a great lane. So congratulations, Marco, on that. I think things are only looking up for you guys. So thank you, Chris. Congrats on this, seriously. And uh, so Marco Palladino, founder and CTO of Kong, I really appreciate you joining us on eSpeaks. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, great. And for everybody following along, have a great rest of your eWeek. Thanks for joining us on eWeek eSpeaks. Go to eWeek.com to hear more conversations with IT thought leaders.